Hello, and welcome to the first of two very special episodes of Recipe Redemption. This Market of Mystery segment deals not with a rare or unusual ingredient, but rather an item that is so commonly available that whole grocery store aisles, nay, departments, nay, entire stores, are devoted solely to its sale and appreciation. Yet, it mystifies many a diner or shopper, evoking feelings of anxiety, indecision, inadequacy, and yes, even fear. I speak, of course, about wine. <laughs> there is far too much to know uh, about wine for me to cover in a single video or even a series of 10. And I make absolutely no pretense that I know even a fraction of all there is to know, or even all you should know. But I know enough to at least get you started. Your journey into wine education is, of course, your own, and how far you travel down that path is entirely up to you. Some of you simply don't like wine, and that's okay. At some point, when I get around to it, I'm planning on a video uh, about beer appreciation and spirits and cocktails as well. Uh, some of you do like wine, but don't really care about the subtler nuances. You like sangria or just a bottle of no-name Pinot Noir to drink while enjoying the company of friends, and you honestly don't even taste it much on the way down. It just gets you where you're going by the end of the evening. No judgment. I get it. I've been there. Um, this is a primer for those of you who do want to appreciate wine more, or at least learn enough about it to look like you do. <laughs> it's, it's embarrassing, um, going to a nice restaurant with someone you're trying to impress and looking at the wine, looking at the wine list like it's written in Aramaic <laughs> and not having the faintest idea what to get. I've been there too. And... Trust me, just picking a wine because it's the second cheapest bottle on the list is not the best strategy. I know you've done this. I know. <laughs> In this first video, I want to cover the basics of how to select and buy wines, how to identify them and hopefully determine quality, uh, which wines will give you the best value and how to pair them with food, including uh, ordering wine in a restaurant. So, how to buy wine. Uh, first question to ask when shopping for wine. Why are you drinking it? Good question, right? Is it for a party or uh, a dinner or just for in-hand drinking? Uh, you know, a little, a little something to relax with. Obviously, the decision is going to be influenced by what you like. Uh, if you hate reds, you don't have much incentive to buy very many reds right? Obviously. However, if you have a favorite varietal, um, don't be afraid to try that varietal from different regions or different producers to experience, uh, you know, different winemaking techniques between the different producers and different terroir between the different regions. There's your first vocabulary word for the day. Um, the place where the grapes are grown has an influence on how the finished wine will taste. Um, the, you know, acidity and the types and amount of minerals in the soil, the amount of sunlight, the amount of rain that they get, uh, average temperatures, all those things combine to influence the flavor of the grape and therefore the flavor of the wine. So you have, uh, let's say, two Pinot Grigios um, that are made at the same time by the same methods um, and even by the same people but are made from grapes from uh, vineyards that are even just a few miles apart could be noticeably different from one another, um, particularly as you gain more experience tasting wine. So terroir is the term they use to describe the influence the growing region has on the finished wine. Now, let's say that you're um, going to be drinking your wine with food. Um, wine pairing becomes a very important um, component. There was an old rule that said you had to drink red wine with red meat and white wine with fish or poultry. And that was it. End of story. But 
screw it. If you like red wine with fish, drink red wine with fish. If you don't like reds, there are whites that are perfectly fine with red meat. It'll be different, but if it's what you like, it's what you like. Nothing wrong with that. No judgment here. Um, also, there is a huge variety of reds and whites out there, as I'm sure you know if you've ever walked through the wine section of your local grocery store even. Um, there's, there's a whole world of wines out there. So red wine with red meat doesn't give you really a whole lot. You know, which red wine will go with which red meat? Um, and that being said, the rule does exist for a reason. Let, let's, let's start there. Red meats tend to be more assertive in flavor. Um, so strong tannins and more aggressive flavors that you find in red wines tend to hold up better when paired with them. But if the meat is spicy, if it's heavily spiced or paired with other equally strong flavors, uh, you could get away with an oaky Chardonnay or um, another citrus forward acidic white wine that cuts through the rich richness of the dish. On the other side of the coin, fish and poultry are, are often more subtly flavored and would be overpowered by a really toothy red. But again, if it's prepared with a lot of stronger flavors, you could get away with pairing, uh, pairing it with a red wine if that's your thing. Uh, something like um, chicken mole enchiladas or a spicy Thai fish curry might work with a fruity Syrah or a rosé rather than strictly adhering to white wines. So um, a lot of it comes down to uh, looking at the back of the a bottle of wine, seeing what kind of flavors and the terminology that they use to describe uh, describe the wine. Words like um, assertive, bold, um, you know, uh, any sort of these, you know, stronger descriptive words gives you an idea that it's, it's more sort of an assertive wine that would pair well with assertively flavored foods. And things like um, delicate, floral, fruity, um, light, those sorts of descriptive words give you an idea that they would pair better with lighter flavored dishes. You, very, very general rule of thumb. Um, as far as brands, yeah, okay, um, buy the brands you like. Uh, ultimately, it comes down to tasting a bunch of wines over time. Don't just, you know, pop open 40 bottles of wine and drink them all. <laughs> over time, learn what brands you like, which ones you don't, and buy the brands you like. But don't be afraid to experiment and try new ones. Um, price is obviously a factor when buying wine, um, either in a store or at a restaurant. But just because something is expensive doesn't mean it's necessarily better. Keep that in mind. Um, they might just pay more for marketing and pass that expense on to you. Um, in the bad old days of 1980s and before, uh, there was a lot less variety available. Uh, and people bought funky old jugs of crap wine because they didn't know any better and couldn't afford the imported French stuff. But we woke up and started demanding better from our domestic producers. And now it's not only possible, but actually quite likely that you'll find at least a decent, if not outright delicious bottle of wine for less than $10. And it doesn't hurt the pocketbook as badly if it turns out that that you know, $7.99 bottle of wine wasn't all that great. Just make a mental note, don't buy that one again, and try the next $7.99 bottle of wine. On the other side of the coin, go ahead and splurge every now and then if you can, and get familiar with those $50 bottles of wine. And if you find one that you really, really like, uh, they do occasionally go on sale for $25 to $30. Buy it, save it for uh, special occasions. Great. Now, looking at your bottle of wine, I'm covering the label. I do not endorse any particular brand. Um, look at the label 
it tells you a lot of information. Maybe not everything about it, but it tells you a lot of information. Um, varietals. If it doesn't list the varietals, like this one is just a red blend. Um, it could be anything. <laughs> uh, anything labeled as a specific varietal. If it says that it's a Cabernet Sauvignon, if it says that it's a um, Gewürztraminer, whatever, uh, it must legally, in the United States anyway, contain a minimum of 90% of that varietal of grape. But the last 10% could be tweaks to the overall flavor. Now this one, it just says that it's a red blend. So then you flip it over and take a look at the back. And many, but not all wineries will actually tell you what the blend is. Now this one does not. <laughs> um, so it could be anything. Now, if it's a producer that you trust, it's probably a good blend. And typically they'll blend grapes because they want to get the best qualities out of all of those grapes together in one wine. So some are a little bit, uh, you know, a little more stringent, some add a little bit more fruitiness, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they're trying to tweak the overall flavor to something that the, the, the final product is going to be uh, enjoyable. But you're trusting the producer to know what's best. So, uh, going for blends like this, you have to, you have to actually do trust the producer. And this one I do, but, um, also on the label, some things to look out for. If it's got a gold medal or a blue ribbon or some sort of award, it says that it won an award, they're bragging about something that may or may not mean anything at all. I tend to ignore those just because it says that it took the gold medal at the 2019, you know, Detroit Invitational Wine Competition. Never really knew that Detroit was much of a wine town. So, uh, you know, does that award actually mean anything? Who who were they competing against? Uh, what were the criteria they used to, to judge the wines? Uh, were they only wines that were produced in Detroit? In which case, whoo, <laughs> strap in kids. Um, so I tend to ignore anything that says that they've won an award because you know, ultimately, it's what ends up in your glass that matters. Um, if it doesn't list at least the location of the winery, and preferably the location of the vineyards where they got the grapes, it could have come from anywhere. Um, I've seen where it just says American Cabernet Sauvignon, which means it could have come from California, or Oregon, or Eastern Washington, or maybe New York, or Tallahassee, you know, Florida. So it could really taste like anything, and it could be a blend of grapes from all over. So you have a lot less idea of what it's going to taste like. The more specific the location, the better able you are with experience to know ahead of time what the wine should taste like and have some ideas. Now, some things that people don't pay attention to is the back label. The label in the back of, back of the bottle. Um, again, it'll tell you the, uh, sometimes, the blend of grapes, if it's a blend, uh, they'll give you tasting notes a lot of times, so it's the, the, the aromas and flavors that you should be looking for when you're tasting the wine. It will all, it should always say um, the percentage of alcohol by volume, so um, ones that are higher in alcohol, they may have used a different process in order to get a higher alcohol content. Um, but flavor-wise, they're going to taste a little bit hotter on the on the tongue because there's more alcohol in it. Um, you may need to let those breathe a little more. So it's something that, that you should uh, be aware of. But if it's uh, an imported wine, it will tell you who imported it. And that's actually kind of important because uh, for you, if you like a particular wine, then you should pay attention to the importer and look and see what other wines that importer imports. <laughs> um, they can help filter based on wineries that they curate for you. They're, they're just like any other business. Importers, they have a portfolio of wineries that they represent, that they purchase from and import into the country. 
So they want to sell as many as possible, right? They want to make money. So their um, wines that they know are going to be good, that they think are good anyway. And if you like the wine that a particular importer has in their portfolio, then maybe you like other things in their portfolio because they have a taste, a palate similar to yours. So those are some things to think about. Um, the, uh, closure, by the way, um, some people kind of judge a bottle based on how it's closed. Um, if it has a, you know, sort of standard traditional cork in it, that some people see that as a, a symbol of quality that's not necessarily true. Um, again, back in the old days, screw tap, screw caps, um, indicated a cheaper quality of wine and even today they tend to uh they tend to indicate an a, a less expensive wine but not necessarily a cheaper wine you get what i'm saying here um the quality of wine overall has gone up a lot because public demand um we've educated ourselves a little more about wine so the fact that it has a screw top it's not necessarily, excuse me, it's not necessarily an indication that it's a bad wine, um, but it's probably an indication it's going to be a l less expensive one. Screw caps, by the way, they're actually more expensive to produce than natural cork closures, but they're better for the environment in a way. The trees that they use uh, for the cork are being over harvested, and so, you know, it, it's having these aluminum caps isn't actually a bad thing anymore. Uh, there are synthetic corks out there as well. And they work fine as, as a closure as well. Um, they tend not to react with the wine because they're plastic. They're, they're not, or kind of a rubber. Um, they're not, you know, cork. They're not a, a fiber. However, natural cork <clears throat> is porous. And so it does allow a small amount of oxygen uh, to pass through it and into the bottle over time. Average of about a milligram of oxygen per year. <clears throat> and the natural slow oxidation of the wine from that oxygen getting in is what causes the chemical changes that mellow a wine as it ages, if it's assertive and complex enough to age. Um, there is a slight possibility of corking. Um, that's another term that they use. It's a negative um, chemical reaction where, um, you know, the, the oxygen that, that gets in, um, reacts with, I think it's a 246 trichloroanisole, um, reacts with oxygen and the wine and the cork to produce musty flavors and aromas. Think, uh, wet cardboard, wet dog, those sorts of things. If you notice those, and particularly in a wine that you've ordered at a restaurant, let your waiter know and send it back. Um, it, it seems like natural cork is necessary for wines intended for cellaring, but you risk corking. Um, probably not a concern for you at this point in your life. You're more than likely focusing on what you intend to, to drink in the next month rather than five or ten years down the line. Um, last piece of advice for buying wine. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, that's the one, that's the one sort of big, big pitfall that people have is they feel like they have to know everything about wine before they buy it. Uh, the wine steward at the grocery store has to carefully choose which wines they're going to stock on the shelves because like your importer, they have a lip, they have limited real estate in the store. So they want to only carry wines that will sell well. Uh, at every price point. So they're going to know a lot more than you do about all the different wines that they have available. And if you ask them, they can help steer you in the direction of wines that match the flavor profile, purpose, and price range that you're looking for. Uh, the same goes for when you're eating out. If you're not sure, ask your waiter if they have any recommendations for the wine. A decent restaurant will have educated their waiters on at least a minimum of knowledge about their wine list. Or if they're fancy enough to have a sommelier, they know to ask uh, him or her any questions you might have about the wine list. 
you can't be expected to know all the wines on the list intimately. And chances are pretty good there are varietals on there that you've never even heard of. So how would you know if it'll go with your dinner? Uh, even when you reach a level of wine education where you have a good idea what varietals generally pair with food, what's the difference between an Italian Pinot Grigio and a French Pinot Gris? They're the same grape, just different countries, so slightly different names. Um, and whether it's going to pair better or worse with your chicken Caesar salad or whatever you've, you've ordered, how do you know? Is the $11 glass of French Bordeaux better value for the experience you get than the $7 glass of Cabernet Franc produced in Sonoma? <laughs> there might be. I'm just pulling these examples out of my butt. But the restaurant staff probably are more knowledgeable about the wines that they carry than you are. So there's no shame in asking for their advice. So, great. You've bought some wine. Congratulations. Tune into episode two of this series to learn more about tasting wines. Thanks for watching.